So my friends, we get back to, we immediately start with business. The first speaker of the day is Lieutenant General Atta Hasnain. His topic for today is passion in the heart and fire in the belly. Let me tell you something about the general. Lieutenant General Sayyid Atta Hasnain is a retired three-star general of the Indian Army and is highly decorated. He is the recipient of the Param Vishishta Seva Medal, the Uttam Yuddha Seva Medal, the Ati Vishishta Seva Medal, Sena Medal, and the Vishishta Seva Medal. His last assignment in service was as the military secretary of the Indian Army. Prior to that, he commanded an army corps in the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir, and we know how difficult that can be. An outstanding officer, General Hasnain had as GOC, in 2010-11 set an excel excellent example of the right use of soft power with hard power. General Hasnain promoted what is called the Hearts Doctrine, which aimed at people as the center of gravity in Kashmir. His unique and innovative approach has been appreciated as a new management mantra across domains in and outside the military. General Hasnain introduced the scholar warrior concept to the Indian Army and after superannuation, has extensively promoted the necessity of incorporating military intellectualism and strategic culture in India. In this regard, General Hasnain is a popular speaker at corporate events. His talks have been greatly appreciated because of the passion, the patriotic fervor, and the linkages that he establishes between national security, the common citizen, and the corporate world. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Lieutenant General Atta Hasnain. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure it is to be here. And let me tell you, right from the moment that one walked into this hall and had a glance around the kind of body language which can be, which is visible here, and the, and the display on the stage itself in the first few minutes of the Sprint Summit is something which is heartwarming. I saw on display self-esteem of the highest order. There aren't too many organizations in the world which, who can congratulate themselves and compliment themselves. The manner which you did just now, I think is excellent. Secondly, I have to remind people wherever I go, what about the national anthem? I'm so glad that you played it at the beginning. Do play it at the end also. Make sure. It's again heartwarming. And what a splendid rendering of the national anthem. Brings out the passion inside you, and that's the very subject which I'm going to speak about today. But having said that, let me first of all thank everyone for having invited me here today. It's not often that you see people in uniform or just out of it coming and speaking to corporate conferences of this nature. My purpose behind it of doing this all over India is primarily to bring to you the Indian Armed Forces in a manner in which you don't see them. You see all the negative agenda on television channels everywhere. And I wish to also tell you, the statement made here, that print isn't going down anywhere. Let me tell you, I want to reassure you myself. Because I have, from television, I have come on to radio now. And from radio, I'm going to go back to print. Ultimately, it is print only which will rule this world. Let me tell you that. Okay. Now, what am I doing here? That's the more important thing. And what am I going to do further? Let's start with the salute to the nation. You've already saluted the nation. Let me salute the nation with a big Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Thank you so much. That's the kind of response which one always expects. That's a salute on giving to the nation on a very sad day when I lost 21 of my very brave soldiers in a very major avalanche in Kashmir. This was a sad duty which I had to perform very often. You know, going up, paying my homage to the martyrs. And today the Indian Army makes sure that wherever we have martyred them, the mortal remains always go back home. I remember the days in Sri Lanka. Till that time, this practice was not there. We used to still leave our martyrs behind wherever we fought. But today, the nation ensures that the mortal remains go back to the dear ones and our and proper performance of last rites is actually done. It also starts always with a dedication to those who have made the supreme sacrifice in the service of the nation. But 
Let me bring you to the subject per se. This. The belly. It will come back. The description of the main subject will come back again. The belly is the energy crucible of the body. Symbolically it's from where the will to do, to achieve, to succeed and to transform comes. And life is all about this. Achieving, succeeding, transforming. You got to move on. And that's an important essential element that the belly carries all this within it. If you have the fire, then you can succeed. It's the heart. In life's lessons, remember the heart. Fire and passion are always included. Success may come through the brain or the mind, but the impact the heart makes is something different. So the heart and the belly are two very important elements of the body in all your endeavors. And if you have passion here and fire here, there's nothing in the world which you can't achieve. This is, this is the poster which was made the first time we evolved this credo in the Army War College. And thereafter this became a credo of mine everywhere. Scholar warrior. When I introduced the scholar warrior concept, this is the one, this is the credo we made there. Passion in the heart, fire in the belly. It was put up in the beginning of every presentation for all our student officers, all our soldiers, everyone to feel from the heart while performing. Just remember that the profession of arms, this is very, very important for us. Passion in the heart, fire in the belly. But it's equally important in the corporate world. Who says that the profession of arms and the corporate profession are different from each other? In fact, almost all the major leadership practices of the corporate profession have been taken from the armed forces. Because that's the profession which actually initially professed all this. The aspect of professionalism, you know, commitment, motivation, and things like that. And the entire leadership world actually emerged from there. Today, they are in sync with each other. The rank and file will imbibe the passion and fire of the leadership. If the leadership can have that last passion, that fire, they will always imbibe it. But the moment you find the leadership without self-esteem, if you find the leadership doesn't have a fire, doesn't have passion, you will find that organization will be defunct virtually. You see, let's now take this to the level of national security. With India at the crossroads of uh, international security efforts, rationale and strategy is all essential. Equally, it needs droves of passion and fire to quell the print picks which attempt to hold us back. We are in a very uncertain world and I can tell you 2017 probably is going to be one of the most uncertain years when the world is rediscovering itself. With all the technology, everything, the advancement which has been made, international politics are taking a back step. The world, human beings do not know how to deal with themselves. But in the end of it, you will find leadership will be the most important thing which will have to emerge. And I am going to talk to you about leadership of a different kind. Starting from here, this is the memorial, the memorial at the Siachen Glacier base camp. If ever there was a situation which demands the last ounce of passion and fire, it is the Siachen Glacier. You hear about it many times in the morning newspapers and say there's an avalanche there or there has been fighting there some years ago and you glance over it and leave it and say, Siachen Glacier, what has it got to do with me? As an Indian citizen, you perhaps need to know what goes on there. What goes on in many other trouble spots of the, of the nation and what people do to make sure that they counter all the negativity of the environment against the nation. This is what Siachen warriors look like. They look awfully dirty, terribly soiled. But this is what warriors on the march, when they are about to move to the glacier, I hope you know that the glacier goes up to a height of 21,000 feet. The glacier means it's a, it's a river, it's a frozen river, 300, 400 feet deep with ice. But on the flank of it is the Saltoro Ridge and I'll explain it to you on a map. Because a map is something which no one will ever present to you 
in, in, in various newspapers or magazines and no one will focus you on what the real problem is. When the Siachen warriors start moving into the glacier to occupy it as a part of their duty, no man lives on the glacier for more than six months. You can't. It's human, biologically impossible to live beyond that. But as you move up, the first sight which you come across is this. Absorb it. It's the most beautiful sight in India. This is, it shows India in its true glory. A nation when can imbibe cultures and religions. And an army which demonstrates this. Demonstrates this practically. No one knows who's going up. He's an Indian army soldier. No one knows what religion, what faith, what caste, what creed he comes from. He just looks at this and says, okay, so God is here. God looks after me, salutes and moves on. It's also called the Sarav Dharam Sthal. All religions under one roof. And that's the principle that the Indian army always follows. I thought a brief moment to just tell you. You will hear about the Siachen Glacier dispute from lots and lots of people. No one will tell you what is the problem actually. Take your attention right in the center between the line of control and the Pakistan's claim line to a point called NJ9842. I can't point it out to you because this is a, a LCD screen. I can't really do this uh, with, with, a, with a laser pointer. It can't be visible on it. Just take your eyes to NJ9842 here. What is the importance of NJ9842? In 1971, we defeated Pakistan, got 93,000 prisoners, created the nation of Bangladesh, an independent nation, and halved the state of Jammu and Kashmir, or rather, Pakistan. At the agreement in 1972, the Shimla Agreement, it was decided to convert the ceasefire line into the line of control, demarcated with the two armies agreeing to do a survey of the line of control. They did this line of control survey right to this point called 9842. And from there, when they looked up, they said, it's humanly impossible to exist in this area at 20,000, 25, 2,000 feet. So let's not go beyond. Let's demarcate it till here. And on paper they put down, from here northwards, the line of control will follow north to the glaciers. The term is north to the glaciers. They left it vague. Seven years later, or six years later, we discovered that Pakistan was sending patrols, expeditions into this area. It was not occupied into this area, this triangle. And we realized that if, if we don't do something about it, this area is going to become Pakistan's territory. So we started sending ours. And it became a competition every year who would go and send their soldiers, mountaineering expeditions, etc. But in 1984, finally we decided that let's establish a permanent presence there. Through winter, through summer, 365 days of the year. So in the May of 1984, we flew in and occupied the Siachen Glacier. And on the flank of the Siachen Glacier, this dotted black line is called the Saltoro Ridge. It is the Saltoro Ridge which we crept upon. And this is the ridge which has gone up to heights of 22,000 feet. We occupied the entire Saltoro. Today, Pakistan claims that their army is at Siachen. I wish to reassure every citizen of India, Pakistan cannot even see Siachen. <laughs> cannot even see Siachen. Till today, they have kept this secret away from the public of Pakistan that their army is not anywhere near Siachen. They are far away from the Saltoro Ridge. What is the point of contention today? The point of contention is that Pakistan claims that north to the glaciers meant the line joining 9842 to Karakoram Pass, which means that all this territory belongs to Pakistan. We claim, or we have claimed, and we've committed ourselves to that, that the boundary must be along the watershed, which is the international system of recognition of boundaries. So we have put our boundary along the Saltoro Ridge, which is the watershed. So this triangle of territory is the territory which is in contention between India and Pakistan. 
Now people say, why does India waste so much of money? Four to five crore rupees a day to maintain troops there. Not a blade of grass grows there. Why don't you just come down from there? Both the armies agree to sign on the dotted line and say, no one to occupy this area. You remember what happened in Kargil? Can you trust that when you come down, the Pakistanis are not going to occupy that area? And if they do occupy it, and the government of India tells us today, please vacate, and that area gets occupied by the Pakistan army, to recapture it will take you 10,000 lives. 10,000 good lives of the Indian army will be lost to recapture this area. Besides that, there's a strategic reason which Indian citizens must understand. You've heard what is called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC. $46 billion has been, is being spent on it by China to bring a trade energy corridor right from Xinjiang up to Gwadar. You heard about that? Okay. Now the beginnings of this corridor are right just north from here. The beginning of this corridor. So why should India vacate the territory from where we have the potential to be able to dominate that corridor which is coming up today? Why should we withdraw from there? No necessity at all. And you mean to say that four crores cannot be spent by a nation of 1.3 billion dollars with people? Four crores a day? I know a lot of lives are lost in the, in the process. But then the Indian army is committed to keeping Siachen as a part of India. Let me just show you some scenes from here. When you start, this is the Saltoro. I was telling you about the Saltoro, this is Saltoro. When you start walking along, moving towards the glacier, you actually laugh at yourself. And you say, my God, a diminutive human being, me, look at the mighty mountains. How can you dominate these mountains? This is what it looks like. This is all the Saltoro on the flank. And once you have gone up slightly higher on the glacier, every movement has to be being, uh, with, with ropes. Because a man may just slip into a crevasse. You know what is a crevasse? Crevasse is ice in the daytime starts melting. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the daytime, the, crevasse, the, the ice suddenly splits. And you'll find a chasm of 300 feet. And there may be there may be a very deceptive sheet of ice glass on top. You may step on it and you may go 300 feet down. No one can bring you out of that. You can't, it's very difficult to get a man out of that. You'll probably break your neck while you're falling down inside. There are many of our fallen heroes whose bodies are still down below in the crevasses. We have lost a total of 827 people in Siachen since the time it was occupied in 1984. Ever heard of a scene, a thing like this? Four point. This is called four point. How you climb an ice wall. And these people are not, this is not adventure sports. That they're climbing this wall. They're with their weapon. Which means after climbing the wall, you reach up and you assault the enemy and you kill him. You probably cut his head off. You've got to have enough energy for that. If you don't have the passion in your heart, you don't have that fire in your belly. You are going to be the one who is going to be cut up and hacked. So you better get that into, into yourself. See this? This is the drop ladders. The system of roots. Some of the roots in the Saltoro are like this. You've got to climb up from there and drop down by a ladder. This is what is called the Bana wall or the Sonam wall. This huge mountain which you are seeing on top. This mountain is the highest peak of the Saltoro. If this is lost to Pakistan, the Indian army can't stay on Siachen. Because they will bring observed artillery fire onto the glacier. In 1987, they made an attempt to try and capture this mountain top, the right hand side. And they succeeded in capturing it. And then we responded with a counter attack. Day after tomorrow is Republic Day. When the veterans are marching by, or you'll find decorated people in, in gypsy vehicles uh, saluting the President of India, one of those people will be a man called Subhada Major Banasingh. 
Bana Singh. Look out for the commentary. Bana Singh will be there. He's a Paramvir Chakra. He's a Paramvir Chakra winner. You know what he did? He was a man tasked along his officer. He and 10, 12 men roped up. They climbed this mountain on the same system of four point. Climbed up. Assaulted the Pakistani post. Killed the men. And since 1987, this post has been with India. Right since then. Unfortunate that last year, on the third of on the second of February last year, very unfortunate, or rather third of February, very unfortunate, we had this huge ice fall. You must have heard of it when 10 men got buried. You heard of Hanuman Thappa. Hanuman Thappa got buried. I'll show you his photograph also. Hanuman Thappa got buried in that. 10 men buried under 35 feet of ice. What do you do? You can't, you, you can't, you can't save him. You managed to pull one man out, but he died in the, in the army hospital at Delhi. Now, if an ordinary human being was sitting on the glacier and this had happened on top of that peak out here, he would have said, what can I do? 35 feet of ice has come down on top of this post where there are 10 men and all 10 men have got buried. See, this is what an avalanche looks like. It's one of the most scary sights anytime in anywhere in the world. It starts with a huge bang and the ice starts coming down. You can, you can run as much as you want. You could be an Olympic champion, you can't beat an avalanche. An effect of an avalanche, you see me at the end on the left side, walking somewhere in an area where an avalanche had occurred. A lorry weighing five tons can be picked up by an avalanche and thrown 400 meters. That's the force that an avalanche carries with it. So to come back here, now see, this is the kind of ice which was on top of this post. Now what are the man who's commanding these troops? He's sitting somewhere else at 15,000 feet and this has happened at 20,000 feet. What does he do? He says, okay, they are dead. I, what can I do? I can't pull their bodies out. No. This particular unit, 19 Madras, had a commanding officer called UK Gurung. Gurung was a simple Gurkha, Nepal, who was a Gurkha soldier at one time, became an officer. From an officer, he was sent to 19 Madras for some time on attachment. The Tambis of 19 Madras loved him so much, they said, we want to keep him with us. And he was also motivated, so he decided to stay back in 19 Madras. So you'll be very happy in the good old Indian Army tradition. A Gurkha in a Tambi unit, he's known as a Gurkha Tambi. Right? He's known as a Gurkha Tambi. This man had brought this unit from, to Siachen from Merat. And before that, he had spoken to all the families of the men in Merat and said, dead or alive, I will bring him back. I will bring a man back. There is going to be no body left anywhere. 35 feet of ice. What do you do? And 21,000 feet working here is something impossible. There is no power. Rations are very limited. Enough for 20 men. What did UK Gurung do? He walked from the glacier, from, from the glacier post to this place, put his flag there and said, I am sitting here. No one is going to move me. I will search for the next 365 days. But I will get my men out. Now this is what happened. See, this is the kind of search operations. 220 men, two avalanche dogs were concentrated at a place where 20 men live. This got, it's got a capacity for 20 to 30 men. It is the lifeline to Bana, that post on top. But how do you bring 220 men here? They had to fly 330 sorties of helicopters to bring them here. You have to bring in equipment such as this, ice cutters. Where do you get ice cutters from? And ice cutters have to be powered, remember. Sitting in Mumbai, it's very comfortable. You can pick up a generator and put on anything. Here, if you need a generator, you've got to fly it from 8,000 feet to 22,000 feet. And let me tell you how oil is flown there. The first time a helicopter moves up, you know, its own aviation fuel is inside. 
So it can only pick one jerry can of oil. 20 liters is all the capacity it has got to lift. It takes that 20 liters and puts it on top. Now it has consumed some of its own aviation fuel. It can bring one rucksack weighing 30 kilos down. Rarefied air, helicopters find it very difficult to, to, to function. When they come down, then they go up with two jerry cans of oil. Now they've reduced the weight of their own oil, of their own aviation fuel. Now one man can be brought down. And this is how this lift takes place. So it must be 330 sorties were flown of helicopters to this place to bring these 200 men to the rescue for 10 days in icy temperatures. February, we are coming into February. The temperature there will be minus 35 to minus 40 degrees at the moment. You take off your glove and you try to take it, even if you try and take a photograph, your fingers will get stuck to your camera. It is that bad. And here, this is where they worked. Just see, the challenge of the ice blocks. If you really want to see the human angle of the glacier, read this wonderful story by a man who's a Mumbaiite. It's called the rope. It's called the rope. And the author of this is called, a person called Captain Raghuraman. Raghuraman is a very prolific speaker in Mumbai circles, Mumbai and Pune circles. Call him sometime to speak and he'll tell you the story, the rope. Just Google it. It's one of the most amazing stories. I don't want to spoil it for you to see how really human beings, what kind of decisions in life they have to take. If you are interested in watching something more about Siachen, watch my TEDx video. It's there on YouTube. It's an 18 minute video on the challenge of being a Siachen warrior. The highest self-esteem in the Indian Army is of those who wear the Siachen medal. See, this is the Siachen medal worn on my left corner of my chest here. <laughs> Let me take you to a different environment from Siachen. Let me take you to Jammu and Kashmir, to the valley. On 12th of September 2011, Outlook surprised me completely when I started getting calls from people to say, we are seeing your, your photograph on a magazine at the airport. What have you been doing? I said, what have I been doing? Suddenly I went on online to see what has Outlook done. I found a cover story on myself. It's amazing. I must be doing something great to be on a cover story of a national magazine. And that too, a positive story on the Indian Army for a change. Otherwise, the <laughs> media always finds only, only loop, you know, something to criticize the army about. Well, this is all about 24-7, 365 day passion and fire leadership, which is called balancing hard and soft power. The conflict-ridden territory of Jammu and Kashmir, as you are aware, in 1989, when we went in there, the Indian Army went in, in to rescue Jammu and Kashmir from the throes of militancy. You should be aware, this was a deep set plan made by Pakistan in 1977 to wreak revenge against India. And the whole idea was to exploit India's caste, linguistic, religious, ethnic, all kinds, regional, any kind of fault line in India. They wanted to exploit that. And in 1987, we gave them an opportunity by bungling up the elections in Jammu and Kashmir. And in 89, when the world was changing as it is changing today, in 1989, the whole world was changing at the end of the Cold War. That is the time when Pakistan decided, if I was a Pakistani, the strategy which I would have certified, this is the finest strategy that they could have followed. 1989 was the most appropriate year to follow it. 1989 was the year when everything was going wrong in India. You, just to remind you, you would have all forgotten it. 1989, Rajiv Gandhi's government had fallen and you had political instability at the center. India's financial reserves by the year 1991 had come down to $1 billion, if you remember. Militarily, we had four divisions sitting in Sri Lanka. Punjab was burning, the Northeast was burning. Right? Socially, we had the Mandal agitation on our hands. You have forgotten everything. 1989 was the crucial year. Now you are seeing how Pakistan views you. They saw you politically, economically, socially, militarily. All four angles. And said, appropriate time. If you can't do it now, you will never do it. Benazir Bhutto did not want to do it at that time. She didn't have the courage because Zia had died. But the Pakistan army convinced her. They said, Madam, if not now, never. 
And that is how she was enthused into giving this great speech at Muzaffarabad, in which she said, it became the, it became the cry of the Kashmiri people later on. Hum kya chahte azadi, hum kya chahte azadi. That became the cry. And the Indian army, sitting in Sri Lanka, sitting in Northeast, in Punjab, for many of our divisions deployed on the border because of the Pakistani exercise, we were at a loss how to handle Kashmir. So we went in all guns blazing. And by the year 2008, 9, 10, as far as terrorist strength is concerned, we had sorted it out. From 10,000 terrorists, we had brought the strength down to 350 to 400. Right? But that's where the story re-begins. The story re-begins. Because now the Pakistani line, the strategy was, if you have, cannot bring in terrorists, start the street agitation. Start throwing stones. And the stone can be a deadly weapon. You may think that the Indian soldier or soldiers anywhere should never be scared of stones because stone is hardly a weapon. Then you realize that the stone is actually a non-violent weapon. It's a non-violent weapon because the world classifies it as it's not a weapon. It's being thrown with human power. You got an AK-47 with you. So now it was a question of how to change this entire thing. The hard doctrine which we brought in here was brought in with a great amount of passion primarily to balance our hard and soft power. Don't let the world accuse us of human rights violations. Be smart as a nation. Continue your military hard operations and yet continue to do that which will not alienate the people. That was the whole idea. What you're seeing me do is speaking to a couple of young Kashmiris who, well, let me tell you, I told them, I'm standing, sitting here on the podium, abuse me as much as you want. And they abused me. They abused me like mad. But at the end of it, when we went outside for a cup of tea, they came to me and this is what they're doing here. They're asking me for my autograph. I said, but why do you want my autograph? You hate India and you hate me. This is okay. But tell us, how can we join the Indian Army? You see, you have to give people a chance to take out all the venom from inside them. And then the positives start emerging. No one realizes that this is what the Indian Army does. On one side, it counters infiltration in the high reaches of Jammu and Kashmir. On the other side, it rescues the very people who have been throwing stones against you. To convince them, you may throw stones against us, but we were nothing against you. We are nothing against you. To bring in this concept and make people understand, the biggest resistance came from my own organization. From within my rank and file, who were so used to only using and brandishing the gun. What you have to realize is, smart nations, smart armies use brain power. They use brain power. And they don't unnecessarily get involved only in the use of the weapon. A soldier on soldier, a weapon on weapon doesn't give you a solution. The solution ultimately comes when the, when the people are with you. When I was last posted in Kashmir as the core commander, I asked someone, what is my mission here? We love in the army to say, what is my mission? So someone said, well, to kill maximum terrorists. I said, okay, very nice. What else do you think? Someone told me, well, bring down the level of terrorism. I said, great. I mean, these are the mundane transactional things. I am a transformational leader. In my time, I will set the tone for the solution of the problem. And what was my aim? My aim, which I evolved for my officers, for my men was, we will mainstream the state of Jammu and Kashmir to the rest of India. Politically, economically, socially, psychologically. Let every Kashmiri say, I am an Indian. Let every Kashmiri say, I'm an Indian. Today, he may not be saying it. He may be alienated. But situations are only temporary. If you have the right leadership, you have the right people, you have the right passion, and you have the right fire, you have the right balance, your leadership will emerge in such a way, it will convince the whole people. And it will convince the Kashmiri, the best lot you have ever got for yourselves is to remain as a part of India. That's what the solution is. Now, how do you, how do you go about this? This is just a, 
a day in the life of the leader, the GOC. 5.30 you get up in the morning. You got a quick telephone call to find out all is well. People give you quick calls to tell you. If something has gone wrong, they will tell you. If something has gone drastically wrong, they will tell you at 2 o'clock at night also. Right? At night, when a GOC 15 code has woken up at 1.30 at night, he knows it's no one calling him for his birthday. Right? It's always for something disastrous. 6 o'clock, gym at home, make sure. 7.30 at the helipad, take off at the helicopter. Get to the line of control. Get to at least two major army posts. Stay with the men. See the things. See the operational requirements. What's been happening here over a period of time. Look at the administration. You are seeing all these BSF videos going around. That's khana nahi hai. Do you know the kind of attention that the Indian army pays to food? When, when Jammu and Kashmir, the people of Jammu and Kashmir don't have food because 25 days the road has been closed. I tell the chief minister of Jammu and Kashmir, why can't you be like the Indian army? We have stocked ourselves for 180 days. 180 days of food and fuel is available with my men, including rum. <laughs> including rum. 180 days is available with my men. Why can't you stock yourselves? And I will go to the last to make sure the man who has to be fed will be given the best of possible food. Don't believe all these ridiculous things which keep coming out on television channels. Then after that, get back. Get back at about 1 o'clock. Two hours in the office. Now you see, who sits in the office? A leader is required to sit in an office. Two hours in the office is sufficient. Only priority decisions. People come to me. This is what is happening. We want to take your decision. Go ahead or don't go ahead. That's the thing. At uh, 3 o'clock, have a brown bag lunch. A brown bag lunch is a great experience. One subordinate of yours, one man, who you will never meet otherwise, innocuous person in your command, comes to you for lunch. He brings his lunch, you bring your lunch. Sit together and discuss. In your three years or four years in that assignment, you will never meet that man. But that day, half an hour you spend with him, you will know him for a lifetime. You'll know him for a life. And this way, if 200 people have had lunch with you, you will remember all the 200. Right? And the best thing is, all of them will give you the most marvelous lunch. Your wife will be only giving you sandwiches. <laughs> right? Not so my wife is sitting here. She always gave me the most fascinating lunch. Right? At, get home, 4.30, meet sources. Sources means intelligence. People who you can't meet outside. They will come meet you. Ordinary people, human beings here and there. Just meet them, listen to them. Be a great listener. Half the time the problem here is people are not willing to listen. Leaders have to be the biggest listeners. You can't be the speakers. If you talk your thing, what are you going to learn from the others? Right? Do that. Little walk time, family time at, for one hour. And the evening 6.30 to 7.30 is evening calls. All the commanders, major commanders are calling you up with their problems and their decisions. You are endorsing them. 7.30 to 8 o'clock change of dress. Very important that you are in the army. We are very particular about our dress. Make sure you are ready for the evening. And then you have an evening social somewhere outside in Srinagar or someplace. Or maybe inside your own garrison. This social function is only a professional function. You are there with professionals who you are meeting. Lots and lots of people coming from outside. For example... Great captains of industry coming from Mumbai, Mumbai to Srinagar. I made sure all of them either came to my house, we sat together to make sure that they understand the problem of Jammu and Kashmir. I can assure you Anil Ambani sahab came and spent two days with me. Why? What, why, what is my importance about explaining things to a person like Anil Ambani? He's the man who speaks everywhere. He's the man who goes and educates people himself because he talks. His networks. If he understands the problem of Jammu and Kashmir the way I understand it, then he will spread the word in the rest of the country. And that's where it's important. I've spent an hour in the evening with him. Next day, I spent two hours with his family and him explaining the problem. This is the issue. At night, one and a half hours, clear the files. Only one and a half hours to clear the files. After that, respond to emails and social media. I'm non normally known as a general who responds within three hours to every email. At midnight, 
telephone calls to all the posts. Just remember one thing. The schedule has little, little scope for routine conferences. Those who believe in this routine conferences are starting at 9 o'clock and ending at 12.30 are no leaders. Everything is about trust. I had the most fascinating staff. They were had to only give me a word, sir, we are doing this. Just go ahead. You have my backing. Yes, that's why I could do all this. Otherwise, I'll be sitting in my office. I'll be only sitting in my office and moping and saying, my God, the whole world is on top of me. Let's give you a little essay, photographic essay. Taking off, you see, transformational leadership, the helicopter, take off at 7.30, land up with the troops at the right place. This is a place where the importance of being with those who are executing your policy. You get an information that has been a major operation. You see, 19th of August 2011, 13 terrorists killed in this particular operation, Bhaktor. Young man, Navdeep Singh, 15 Maratha ally, Ashok Chakra, killed, bartered in this operation. Killed four terrorists himself. Himself killed four terrorists. If you ever want to read the story, if you ever want to read the story, this operation was also called Point Blank Leadership. Point Blank Leadership is a lovely story. You can Google it. Point Blank Leadership was all about this man with 10 men held the fire. He saw 19 terrorists coming from across the river, crossing into our territory. He told his men, don't fire now at 200 meters and 300 meters. You will kill three, four. The rest of them will run away. Let them come right close to us. So he held his fire. And they came to handshaking distance. That's the time when he opened up. Killed 13. Rest of them injured two. Rest of them vanished. Doesn't matter. But in doing so, the amount of fire which he had, his own ammunition finished. And he bent down to pick up his ammunition to refill his weapon. And that's the time a bullet pierced his head. And he died. I got this report at 2.30 in the night. I said, what's happened? Is everyone safe in the operation? They said, no. The officer seems to have been injured very seriously. I prayed. Straight away, I prayed. At 6.30 in the morning, I was at the spot. When I reached there, it is these very poignant memories in life you have. My helicopter was going down and there was a second helicopter rising up. When I looked, I saw the body of Navdeep Singh being taken in the second helicopter. I could not see his body. But I landed there and I saw the bodies of the terrorists lying there. I said, my God, this is a great occasion. Promote the commanding officer. I promoted him straight away. This is the commanding officer, his boss, Navdeep's boss. He needs recognition at the right time. Straight away. A, this unit, by the way, is a Maharashtra unit, Maratha Alai. Right? Ah. You've got to keep proving it to people that you're as good as them. Muck your hands. Wherever you can display and demonstrate, land up on the post, say, tell, tell someone, give me your weapon. I'm going to fire. And let's have a firing competition. So you fire and demonstrate. Walk along the line of control. This is the fence of the line of control. Walk. Take a distance to walk of 8 to 10 kilometers to see what is the morale like. What is the motivation of the people? Come back to the, to the valley floor. From soldiering, you are suddenly into an orphanage. And that's me and my wife, my wife and I, at an orphanage, again, run by a passionate young Maharashtran. Maharashtran. I say Maharashtra has got a tremendous amount of this passion. Pune-based man. <laughs> Organization, NGO called Borderless World Foundation. Borderless World Foundation. Run by him. And... Amazing young man who runs this thing. This is an orphanage for children of terrorists who have been killed. Now can you, can you, this is the girl child. What happens to the families of the terrorists who are killed? They are not part of the war. And you see this responsibility he is taken upon. He has been kidnapped three or four times by the terrorists. But the terrorists at the end of it feel, my God, amount of work this man is doing. Don't do anything to him. <laughs> see, there are, there, the, the, the human heart is always there. Awami Sunwais, conduct Sunwais, grassroots politics, allow people to give out their grievances to the, to, the, to the local administration. Media, handle the media from time to time. Meet politicians in the afternoon, 
calling up these are politicians coming and meeting you some problem of land some problem in a particular constituency etc now you say what does the army have to do with it in a militancy affected hit area such as this the army has everything to do with it today mr shekhar gupta is going to be here he's not coming yet mr shekhar gupta is going to be here tell him janata hasnan was here before he's a great friend of mine he is the man who wrote this article in 2013 to say the army has no place in kashmir it should vacate the valley and go back to the line of control so i sent him an email in the morning as a shekhar gupta sahab are you willing to publish a complete counter to your article every single point you have mentioned i will counter he said absolutely so i wrote google it sometime 13th of december 2013 is called victory in the valley define it before you propose it no one has understood the meaning of victory for me the victory of the indian army is when the last kashmiri has said jai hind i am an indian that is the time it is like the misreading of the situation in sri lanka where a lot of people feel that the sri lankan government and the sri lankan army won the war i say no i have been there many times and i have been a part of the ipkf myself and in the last tamil says he is a sri lankan they haven't won the war the same way okay <clears throat> have meetings with the police organizations brief the governor this is all on a single day it can happen on a single day all this can happen brief the governor of jammu and kashmir on the situation meet the media from delhi very important to giving time to the media because you otherwise they're going to write all kinds of things which are not true interlocutors mr dilip padgaonkar late mr dilip padgaonkar i don't know why is everyone a maharashtrian in this in this particular presentation i don't know right mr padgaonkar the former editor of the times of india what an outstanding man great ideas with him interlocuting and then the family is visiting you many times the family is visiting you many times and you find the passion and the fire in you doesn't permit you to spend time with the family what you are doing is establishing direct leadership there are night times in that one and a half hours at night between 12 and 130 making calls to different posts there are 1000 posts or more in kashmir random post you say i want to speak to that post a man comes on you have never seen that man come on the line who are you i am havaldar so and so or i am naib sardar so and so wonderful you are my soldier tell me first thing what did you eat for dinner today he tells me i said tell me what was the quality of tomatoes which came to you today munnen i am a general of the indian army i am talking about onions potatoes and tomatoes important that is how your men will feel for you and even and in his weak moments every the weakest moment of a human being is at 130 at night he will tell you everything He will tell you everything. Because I'm ye kharaab hai, ye kharaab hai, ye kharaab hai. Good. Then I will make sure that I get after the system to make sure everything is improved there. Operationally, I must ring up a commander and find out. At six o'clock in the evening, the information with me is there's a likely infiltration attempt in your area. Tell me, have you got the same information? He tells me, no, sir. No one has told me. Now you get back into the system. You know, 26/11 in Mumbai, it took place. because somewhere someone missed the story there were so many inputs from all over about 2611 likelihood someone missed putting that all together and somewhere someone missed out passing the information you may have information with you is no good if you haven't passed it on to the next man and if you are going to pass it in a in a in a post bag which will take 10 days to reach the next man there is no point and that's transactional leadership when the man says i have given the information how have you given it by post so infiltration is on going to be on 1st february i have received my letter on 15th february very nice change all that speak one to one directly you have you got the information i have got no i have not here's the information now let me find out who's the culprit why it has not come to you that is the thing i'm not going to have already pass my time i'm not going to spend time on this but i do just want to tell you this experience of how organizations can change earlier from my earlier kashmir tenure i was sent here to transform this organization 
It's called the Junior Command Wing of the Army War College, where everything was transactional. And I'll give you a simple example. When I came to them and I asked them, how many prizes do you give for teaching on this course? This course, how many prizes do you give? They said, one prize. I said, and show me the prize. They showed it to me. Small little, it was a, it was a little trophy with little, little tickets all around it. No way that the officer could carry that back to his family to show them that I am the best student on this course. So I said, now take out your pen and paper and note down. This is my order. You will make 30 prizes. He said, 30 prizes for what? I said, if you question it again, I will make it 40 prizes. <laughs> and each time you question, I will, I will increase it by 10 because I don't need a reason to give a prize. I'm a man who's positive in nature and I appreciate everything about human beings. I want to give a prize to every human being if necessary. And so we started giving 30 prizes. And if I ask you today to name 30 events for which you can give prizes and print summit, I'm sure you can name 100. So there's no problem. You as a positive human being, you can just identify areas where you want to give prizes. So that's just an example. This is where the, this is where the, um, this credo, fire in the belly, passion in the heart and fire in the belly was born. And one left behind the legacy with this famous statue. It's called the statue of the scholar warrior. See the, see the warrior, the warrior with his spear in his hand and see the books in front of him. The idea behind it is the profession of soldiering. Don't think that everything is only physical. The profession of soldiering is all about your heart and your brain, your mind. When put it together, you will be the victor. This is the legacy which one left behind. This is the term. You can read it. It was done to epitomize officers empowered with knowledge, skill and courage at the Army War College. And beautiful last line, where the tigers earn their stripes. That's Bana Singh on top. That's Mahadik, another Maharashtrian. I don't know how I've got all Maharashtrians here today. RR commander, 41RR. 41RR is a Maratha unit. Killed last year in 2015. In sustained operations. And his wife is nine years over age to join the army. But the army has taken out that rule. Now she's joined the army as a cadet. She's training and will become an officer now. Our widow, his widow. That's the passion. And down below, you can see Manoj Pandey, Paramvir Chakra from Kargil. So the Indian Army needs your support. All the passion and all the fire will always be there. Just one thing. When you see the evening news, don't believe all the nonsense they talk about the Indian Army. Right? Listen to people like me who also come on NDTV and at times now very often. Right? <laughs> Question R. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Two minutes for questions. Overshot the time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Uh, General Sir, for you, a sentence that we typically in Mumbai that you have put in the middle of I have uh, five minutes if I can for anyone who wants to question. Uh, okay, are there any quick questions for quick the general, questions. please? Anyone who's got a question. Yeah. Just two questions. Just I two can just allow two, two questions. questions. Please. Yeah. Please. Sir. Are your services still utilized by this current government in handling this problem? Okay. And the second question, anyone else? I'll combine the questions. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll explain, I'll explain the question. I got it, I got your question, sir. The second question was about that a lot of money is being given to the Kashmiri youth to throw stones or, you know, carry out rather rabble rousing all over the place. Is it true or not? And this question is the government making use of my services. Let me tell you, the day I retired, I got a call from Mr. Ajit Doval. 
and this is three and a half years before he became the national security advisor. And he said, Jan Saab, we need you. I said, for what, sir? He said, well, I'm a part, or I am the director of the Vivekananda International Foundation. Uh, we need you for your knowledge of Kashmir. I said, why Kashmir? You mean to say my intellect is only limited to Kashmir? She said, tell me, name your thing. I said, if you want me to come to Vivekanand, then I want Kashmir. I want Pakistan. I want Afghanistan. I want West Asia. And I want radical Islam. These are the subjects for me to research. So I am a part of Vivekanand today. And public speaker at large, all military institutions, universities and colleges, corporate organizations. Yesterday I was in Jaipur speaking at the Jaipur Literary Festival. Day before yesterday I was at Vaipur, Calcutta. So I am everywhere speaking on different subjects. Anyone who needs me, I'm always there. <laughs> so your question, very good question. Demonetization, has it affected it? In the year 2008 when stone throwing started, this, I identified the stone thrower. It was a great strategy. The stone thrower in Baramula, the city I was commanding at that time, the stone thrower in Baramula was never from Baramula. He came from Sopur. He was an importee. And the Baramula guy went to Sopur to throw stones. Right? So you didn't know who were throwing stones. When you finally caught hold of them, interrogated them, we realized that most of them, number one, they were drug addicts who needed their daily dose of smack. Number two, they were radiwalas who were told, take 300 rupees, don't put ready today, you would have earned 150 to 200 rupees as profit, 300 rupees here, throw stones. Stone throwing became a profession, an amazing profession, right? Uh, demonetization, this is the trend in 2008, 9, 10. In 2016, it was different. 2016, I think, was driven a lot from, uh, no doubt, from within the communities, but very largely from the mosque. Very largely from the mosque. And the people who were throwing stones in 2016 were far younger. 12, 13 and 14 year old vigilants. More dangerous than anything. This demonetization has given a temporary relief, reprieve. But let me tell you, they'll find ways of going around it. We are going through a period at the moment of relative peace. 2017, touch wood, keep your fingers crossed, I hope, because of all the uncertainties of the world, nothing major should happen in Kashmir. But this is a window for the government of India and the government of Jammu and Kashmir. This window should be exploited like the way we were exploiting it in 2011 and 12. What were we doing? Make sure the apple crop is great. 4,000 crores worth of apple went from in my time. When money fills pockets of people, people don't throw stones. Right? Get 2.5 million tourists into Kashmir, no one will throw stones. It's they who are creating the situation and behind the instigation of this is the hand of the ISI. Thank you very much. Sir, one, Jayan. one last question, sir. Sir, please. General Sahib, it's because of people like you that this poetry by Allama Akbal makes sense. Yunano Mr. Ruma, you know, the Greece, Yunan is Greece and Mr. is, of course, Egypt and Rome. Yunano Mr. Ruma submit gaye jahan se, ab tak magar hai baaki naam wo nisha hamara. Kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi hamari, sadiyo raha hai dushman, daure zama hamara. Sare jahan se achcha hindustha hamara, hum bul bulay hai iski ye bul chita hamara. Can I have the last word? Please, sir. Sorry. Can I have the last word? Constructing the Muzaffarabad road and the Kaman Aman Setu bridge. Every day I got a report that the Pakistanis are putting up something different in terms of posters. The posters which got to my nerve was a poster they put up one day saying, telling the Kashmiri, Pakistan se rishta kya? La ilaha illallah. Someone said, sir, what is the meaning of this? I said, don't worry. I'll explain you. I said, go and put a billing there, huge board. Sare jahan se achcha, Hindustan hamara. And the other side of it was, what is it? Nahi sikhata, kya hai wo? Mazhab nahi sikhata. Mazhab nahi sikhata, aapas mein bair rakhna. That is all I explained. And the next day, they took down that one. So it is a poster war from time to time. Thank you so much for the you, wonderful General, way that you were sir, it up. Sir, I am the host, so I still have the last word. Amit Shah, can I please request you to come up on stage and felicitate the general. Ladies and gentlemen.
in that call literally starting with a bang? 